you know, hopefully now they have a little bit of an understanding of the different kinds of computers that are out there and the different ways you can program them. You know, fundamentally we have smaller systems called shared memory systems like a node and archer is a shared memory system. All the cores have access to one memory space and they're quite easy to program. You can program them using OpenMP, which is a threaded based thing, or you can program them in MPI as well. Okay, but you can only really get small computers in that. So if you've got an application and you want to port it and parallelize it, then quite often people will take that serial application and they'll add OpenMP to it because it's quite easy to do in the first instance. And that'll let them explore how easy it is to parallelize their code. Uh, but once you've done that, you can run things on a small cluster like on Archer up to 24 cores. Which, you know, if you've done your job well, will make your code run 25, four times faster. Which is great. Um, but it doesn't let you use more than that. And then if you've got a problem that needs lots of memory, of course, you're still restricted to this single memory space and a single node. On, on Archer, that's 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes, depending on what node you're using. But ultimately, most programs want to go beyond that and use larger numbers of nodes, so they end up using distributed memory parallelism and stuff, this MPI thing, where you can run as many processes as you want you can use as many nodes as you want, but it's a little bit hard to write your code. You have to implement it all before it will work, and you have to manually set up all how you split up your data and all that kind of stuff. And then we have accelerators, which can also help you, but uh, not all programs map well to accelerators. Okay. So, so hopefully, you have a little bit of understanding of that, and that lets you choose which kind of computer you want to use which kind of computer your code will be useful for. All I want to do for the next, say, 10 minutes is just give a little bit of overview of where we see this parallel computing and high performance computing going in the future. Okay. So we are working towards what we call exascale computers. So the largest machines in the world uh, are what we call petascale computers. Um, so Archer runs about 1.6 petaflops. Uh, an exascale computer is about a thousand times as big, and that's sort of where we we see ourselves going. Not that you really need to care about that. That's something that interests people who do HPC like me. But for you, all that means is that there is a path which we go down and have been going down for a long time, where computers get bigger and bigger over time, larger and larger. So what does that what does that mean for us? Well, at the moment, the biggest machine in the world is about 100 petaflops. It's about 60 times bigger than Archer. Um, and we're aiming for computers which are 10 times as big as that, computers which will run at an exaflop in speed. But this has lots of challenges for us. Okay, It has challenges in that the way you get there is you have very large numbers of nodes, but it also you have very large numbers of cores on each node. As we come to look, the biggest machine in the world, it has 10,000 nodes. Each node has uh, about a thousand cores inside it. So to be able to efficiently use that machine, you need to be able to have a program which can split up into lots of bits, and each one of those bits needs to be able to split up into a thousand pieces to be able to use all these thousand cores that you have on the, on the node. And the second biggest machine in the world has 3,000 cores per node, so it's even more parallelism that you have to. There are also other challenges for us going forward, so um, we see issues with the amount of power you can deliver to these systems and how often these systems will fail. When you get up to a system that is large as the biggest one in the world, where it has 10, 10 million processes inside it, okay, in, in 10,000 nodes, um, sorry, 10 million cores. Not 10 million processes. You actually get to a point where it's quite common to see some of those processors, some of those cores failing every day. And that means that you have to be able to write programs which cope with that. Now, again, it's not something that you necessarily have to consider, but it's something for us as people who are designing programs for parallel computers, designing software which programs run on, we have to start considering how do you deal with failures? How do you have a large program that's running and then one of the cores, one of the processes, one of the nodes stops working, can we deal with that kind of thing? So a lot of work is ongoing at the moment in looking at resiliency and fault tolerance there and how you, you deal with that kind of stuff. Um, but what we see is that going forwards, 
we're going to have ever more numbers of cores on a processor and we're going to have ever more larger vector units. So we talked a little bit yesterday about what a vector unit and uh, modern processors can do 8 or 16 floating point instructions at once on a single uh, instruction cycle, but to do that your program has to nicely um, have to nicely uh, map to that. We're also seeing that memory is becoming more complex. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we're seeing that, pros that the way systems are going, actually, you're not going to have this separate memory, processor, network, uh, disk stuff. We're all going to be combined into a single chip, or system on chip. So the biggest machines in the world are going towards this idea of a system on chip, where you have the network directly on the processor, and you have a memory directly on the processor. Um, this means it's easier to build large-scale systems and cheaper in terms of power to build large-scale systems. Um, so that's where we can see it going. Actually, in, in, in a lot of ways, for a programmer, it doesn't make that much difference, but from a hardware perspective, it's quite interesting. We see, coming down the line, I showed you this picture here where we had the processor and the memory and the disk are all separate. But actually, we can see that modern processors are moving away from this. So the latest Intel accelerator called the KNL, and the latest NVIDIA GPU called the Pascal, uh, the G100, um, both have the memory directly attached to the processor, stacked on top of it. OK, so they have this concept of high bandwidth, fast memory. They call it fast, it's, maybe it's high bandwidth, directly on top of the processor. And then they also have access to main memory, which is further away. We also have technology coming down the line in the next couple of years called non-volatile memory, which is going to come along and is much, much faster than disk, a bit slower than normal memory, and is going to sit there as if it was a disk, hard disk, where you can read and write data to it, and it will persist uh, after you turn the computer off, turn it back on, it'll, this data will still be there but you get much, much higher performance. So we now move into a situation where, from a programming perspective, your memory is getting a bit more complex, uh, and you also have different memory regions to do different things. So you have fast, high-performance memory very close to the processor, which should mean that applications go faster, because a lot of applications are performance is memory bandwidth dominated, and this kind of high bandwidth memory deals with that. You'll have normal main memory, which is fine, and then you'll have non-volatile memory, which means you can load up very large data sets into, a, into a, somewhere where you can easily access and work on them. What this actually means in terms of high-performance computing is still being worked out. We have a number of projects ongoing at the moment to look at how you take a program and what changes you need to do to be able to use this. But if you are going to be doing any programming in computational simulation over the next five or ten years, it's likely that you'll have to start looking at Right, which kind of memory do I want this data to be in? Which kind of memory do I want this bit to be in? Uh, and where, how that sits inside the program. So if you're designing programs going forward, it's just worth bearing in mind. Is there any space here where I can think, well, these data sets, it'd be easy to move these to one kind of memory and these data sets to another kind? Yeah. The, the real problem with cache is it's, um, it consumes a lot of energy. So the, the, the reason it's fast memory is it's built in a different way, but it has to take a lot of power and a lot of transistors to build it. So it's just a very expensive thing for them to increase. Whereas it turns out they can make this high bandwidth memory at a cheaper cost using less electricity. It's not quite as fast as cache. But they can make that sort of bigger and, and cheaper, okay, basically. Right. So it's more like a manufacturing cost balancing exercise. What does that mean for writing programs going forward? Well, we're going to have to be able to exploit memory hierarchies. And fundamentally, um, we're looking at a scenario where any program we're going to be using large scale systems is going to have to parallelize very well. So you need to be looking at your program and saying, where could I split up work in here? Is it possible to split this up and split it up another level and split it up another level to distribute it to all these different working units? 
And there is a real focus now going on about not moving data around. Because actually, if you look at computers and where energy is spent inside them, moving data from memory to processor to network, moving data costs a lot of energy. So there's a lot of focus on algorithms which will keep data local to a processor and do work on that while still being able to do the, the uh, software you want to do. So people are really sort of, when they're writing their programs, trying to think, you know, the way I'm writing this, am I restricting the amount of moving of data around? And if I am keeping that to a minimum, that should give me the best performance going forwards. Of course, it's a hard thing to do. That's an abstract concept. And then you have the actual application that you want to write. But that's what people are trying to keep in mind. Uh, going forwards. Uh, yeah. This will mean that hopefully <coughs> we have new algorithms coming along which can help with this. Um, people are also getting much more uh, interested in what we call mixed precision or low precision arithmetic. So if you write a program at the moment in Fortran or C to do scientific simulation, it's likely you'll use double precision data types. So uh, double precision number is stored in 8 bytes. But actually, for a lot of ap applications, a lot of algorithms, depending on what they're doing, they don't necessarily need all that precision. They could actually store their data in four bytes, what we call uh, half precision, and still, still produce the correct numbers. So, and that means you can save a lot of memory, and you can, uh, conversely, increase your, the amount of processing you can do because you're working on smaller chunks of data. So people are also quite interested in well, you've used double precision here, but do you really need that? Now, you can't just go and change your whole application into single precision or half precision and expect it to work. You need to go and have a look, look at it and work out your sensitivity to numerical precision, what kind of data types and data you're actually using. But for some applications, it's quite possible to move into single precision or half precision modes. And that can give you a performance increase and reduce the amount of memory you're using straight away. Um, of course, this move to larger numbers of cores, large amounts of parallelism, is fine if you can parallelize your program, but what, what happens if it's very hard to parallelize your program? Well, there are still ways that you can use these systems. So you can do parameter stat scan studies. Instead of taking one program and parallelizing it across very large numbers of cores, we can just run lots of copies of the same program looking at different input data sets. And that still lets us use a very large system and lets us do different science, but we can do our parameter scans um, uh, across that. We may be caught out by decreasing memory per core. That might mean you, know, you might want, still want to parallelize your program to use more nodes so you can get access to more memory. But actually what we see of the technology coming down the line, memory per, per node is not going to be an issue. So this non-volatile memory which is coming along looks like it's going to be very large and you can easily have four or six terabytes of memory per node in this non-volatile memory. So we don't now really see memory being a, uh, a massive issue. The nice thing about teaching a course like this is that whilst it all sounds, well, yes, this is not really what I need for my research, I'm doing small-scale stuff, what we tend to find is the hardware we use at very large computers like Archer and, and the biggest machines in the world tends to trickle down to desktops and laptops and computers you have access to com or, uh, in a commonplace way reasonably quickly. So, you know, on Archer we're using 24 cores a node, um, and a common uh, laptop of your two or four or eight cores per node, but we see that moving with time. So we started using multi-core processors about five years before we were in laptops and, and desktops in year four. So we see larger scale multi-cores come into the environments that you're in, the environments you're commonly using, which means you're going to have a parallel processor, a reasonable parallel shared memory machine kicking around if you just have a laptop or a desktop. In the future. So any work you can do to take your application and parallelize it is going to help you on a small scale system or a medium scale system on a, on a large scale system and that, that's um, beneficial. I just thought I would put this in to, to bring us right up to date. So this is a, 
uh, some description of the biggest machine in the world, which was announced in June. It's a Chinese system. It's three, three times bigger than the previous biggest machine in the world, which was also a Chinese system. Um, and it's an embarrassment to the US because the US banned uh, processor exports to China to stop them building these systems. So they've gone off and built their own processors uh, and managed to build something that's, that's way bigger than the US is going to deploy for a while. Actually, it, in reality, it's not a very nice system. So it has uh, 10,000 nodes. Each node has four processors. Each processor has 256 cores plus some extra ones. But you only have 8 gigabytes of memory per processor, so it's quite small. The memory is very slow. It's what we call DDR3 memory. Whereas if you look at like a GPU, you'd have DDR5 memory. Um, they're very simple. They've got hardly any cache on them. So they've got about 64 kilobytes of cache per core. So in reality, it's probably quite a hard system to program and use efficiently. But it let the Chinese uh, build a system which was uh, 93 petaflops. Petaflops compared to Archer, which is what 1.5, 1.6 petaflops. So it's sort of 60 times bigger than Archer, and, and they could build it quite easily. It cost them a lot of money. It cost them about 300 million dollars, but it let them come in and take it to number one spot. So this is quite an extreme end of the spectrum, but it's the kind of machine we would expect Archer to be in about five years' time. It's not as poorly usable, but that sort of scale, that number of nodes, that number of cores. So high performance computing, even if you only end up using packages and never write your own code, it's useful to understand what's going on underneath and it's useful um, to be able to exploit it at different uh, levels of performance.